some women, at least, can meet the physical standards VMI imposes on men, are capable of all the activities required of VMI cadets, prefer VMI's methodology over VWILs, could be educated using VMI's methodology, and would want to attend VMI if they had the chance. Since its founding in 1839, the Virginia Military Institute, VMI, was the only male-only public undergraduate higher learning institution in the state of Virginia. Women had never been allowed admission, that is, until the fall semester in 1997. In 1990, the United States brought suit against Virginia and VMI, alleging that the school's exclusively male admissions policy violated the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. The district court ruled in favor of VMI and, on appeal, the Fourth Circuit reversed, finding that VMI's admissions policy indeed violated the Equal Protection Clause. In response to that reversal, Virginia offered to create a parallel program for women instead of changing its general admissions policy to admit them. The district court once again sided with VMI and, on appeal, this time the Fourth Circuit agreed, holding that the two programs would offer substantively comparable educational benefits. The question before the court in this case was whether VMI's creation of a women's only academy as a comparable program to a male only academy satisfied the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. In a 7 to 1 decision, the Supreme Court said no, holding that the school's male only admissions policy violated the Equal Protection Clause since it did not show that the gender-biased admissions policy achieved educational diversity or any other exceedingly persuasive justification for its existence. And now, the 1996 opinion of the court in United States v. Virginia. Justice Ginsburg delivered the opinion of the court. Virginia's public institutions of higher learning include an incomparable military college, Virginia Military Institute, or VMI. The United States maintains that the Constitution's Equal Protection Guarantee precludes Virginia from reserving exclusively to men the unique educational opportunities VMI affords. We agree. Part 1 Founded in 1839, VMI is today the sole single-sex school among Virginia's 15 public institutions of higher learning. VMI's distinctive mission is to produce citizen soldiers, men prepared for leadership in civilian life and in military service. VMI pursues this mission through pervasive training of a kind not available anywhere else in Virginia. Assigning prime place to character development VMI uses an adversative method modeled on English public schools and once characteristic of military instruction. VMI constantly endeavors to instill physical and mental discipline in its cadets and impart to them a strong moral code. The school's graduates leave VMI with heightened comprehension of their capacity to deal with duress and stress, and a large sense of accomplishment for completing the hazardous course. 
VMI has notably succeeded in its mission to produce leaders. Among its alumni are military generals, members of Congress, and business executives. The school's alumni overwhelmingly perceive that their VMI training helped them to realize their personal goals. VMI's endowment reflects the loyalty of its graduates. VMI has the largest per-student endowment of all public undergraduate institutions in the nation. Neither the goal of producing citizen soldiers nor VMI's implementing methodology is inherently unsuitable to women, and the school's impressive record in producing leaders has made admission desirable to some women. Nevertheless, Virginia has elected to preserve exclusively for men the advantages and opportunities a VMI education affords. Part 2 Section A From its establishment in 1839 as one of the nation's first state military colleges, VMI has remained financially supported by Virginia and subject to the control of the Virginia General Assembly. Civil war strife threatened the school's vitality, but a resourceful superintendent regained legislative support by highlighting VMI's great potential through its technical know-how to advance Virginia's post-war recovery. VMI today enrolls about 1,300 men as cadets. Its academic offerings in the liberal arts, sciences, and engineering are also available in other public colleges and universities in Virginia. But VMI's mission is special. It is the mission of the school to produce educated and honorable men, prepared for the varied work of civil life, imbued with love of learning, confident in the functions and attitudes of leadership, possessing a high sense of public service, advocates of the American democracy and free enterprise system, and ready as citizen soldiers to defend their country in times of national peril. Section C. VMI produces its citizen soldiers through an adversative or doubting model of education, which features physical rigor, mental stress, absolute equality of treatment, absence of privacy, minute regulation of behavior, and indoctrination in desirable values. As one commandant of cadets described it, the adversative method dissects the young student and makes him aware of his limits and capabilities so that he knows how far he can go with his anger, how much he can take under stress, exactly what he can do when he is physically exhausted. VMI cadets live in Spartan barracks where surveillance is constant and privacy non-existent. They wear uniforms, eat together in the mess hall, and regularly participate in drills. Entering students are incessantly exposed to the rat line, an extreme form of the adversative model comparable in intensity to Marine Corps boot camp. Tormenting and punishing, the rat line bonds new cadets to their fellow sufferers, and when they have completed the seven-month experience, to their former tormentors. VMI's adversative model is further characterized by a hierarchical class system of privileges and responsibilities. 
a dyke system for assigning a senior class member to each entering class rat, and a stringently enforced honor code, which prescribes that a cadet does not lie, cheat, steal, nor tolerate those who do. VMI attracts some applicants because of its reputation as an extraordinarily challenging military school and because its alumni are exceptionally close to the school. Women have no opportunity anywhere to gain the benefits of the system of education at VMI. Section B. In 1990, prompted by a complaint filed with the Attorney General by a female high school student seeking admission to VMI, the United States sued the Commonwealth of Virginia and VMI, alleging that VMI's exclusively male admission policy violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Trial of the action consumed six days and involved an array of expert witnesses on each side. In the two years preceding the lawsuit, the district court noted VMI had received inquiries from 347 women, but had responded to none of them. Some women, at least, the court said, would want to attend the school if they had the opportunity. The court further recognized that with recruitment, VMI could achieve at least 10% female enrollment, a sufficient critical mass to provide the female cadets with a positive educational experience. And it was also established that some women are capable of all of the individual activities required of VMI cadets. In addition, experts agreed that if VMI admitted women, the VMI ROTC experience would become a better training program from the perspective of the armed forces because it would provide training in dealing with a mixed gender army. The district court ruled in favor of VMI, however, and rejected the equal protection challenge pressed by the United States. That court correctly recognized that Mississippi University for Women v. Hogan was the closest guide. There, this court underscored that a party seeking to uphold government action based on sex must establish an exceedingly persuasive justification for the classification. To succeed, the defender of the challenged action must show at least that the classification serves important governmental objectives and that the discriminatory means employed are substantially related to the achievement of those objectives. The district court reasoned that education in a single gender environment, be it male or female, yields substantial benefits. VMI's School for Men brought diversity to an otherwise co-educational Virginia system and that diversity was enhanced by VMI's unique method of instruction. If single-gender education for males ranks as an important governmental objective, it becomes obvious, the district court concluded, that the only means of achieving the objective is to exclude women from the all-male institution VMI. Women are indeed denied a unique educational opportunity that is available only at VMI, the district court acknowledged, but VMI's single-sex status would be lost, and some aspects of the school's distinctive method would be altered if women were admitted. 
allowance for personal privacy would have to be made. Physical education requirements would have to be altered, at least for the women. The adversative environment could not survive unmodified. Thus, sufficient constitutional justification had been shown, the district court held, for continuing VMI's single-sex policy. The Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit disagreed and vacated the district court's judgment. The appellate court held, the Commonwealth of Virginia has not advanced any state policy by which it can justify its determination under an announced policy of diversity to afford VMI's unique type of program to men and not to women. The appeals court greeted with skepticism Virginia's assertion that it offers single-sex education at VMI as a facet of the Commonwealth's overarching and undisputed policy to advance autonomy and diversity. The court underscored Virginia's non-discrimination commitment, quote, it is extremely important that colleges and universities deal with faculty, staff, and students without regard to sex, race, or ethnic origin, unquote. That statement, the Court of Appeals said, is the only explicit one that we have found in the record in which the Commonwealth has expressed itself with respect to gender distinctions. Furthermore, the Appeals Court observed in urging diversity to justify an all-male VMI, the Commonwealth had supplied no explanation for the movement away from single-sex education in Virginia by public colleges and universities. In short, the court concluded, a policy of diversity which aims to provide an array of educational opportunities, including single-gender institutions, must do more than favor one gender. The parties agreed that some women can meet the physical standards now imposed on men, and the court was satisfied that neither the goal of producing citizen soldiers nor VMI's implementing methodology is inherently unsuitable to women. The Court of Appeals, however, accepted the district court's finding that at least these three aspects of VMI's program, physical training, the absence of privacy, and the adversative approach, would be materially affected by co-education. Remanding the case, the appeals court assigned to Virginia, in the first instance, responsibility for selecting a remedial course. The court suggested these options for the Commonwealth. Admit women to VMI, establish parallel institutions or programs, or abandon state support, leaving VMI free to pursue its policies as a private institution. In May 1993, this court denied certiorari. Section C. In response to the Fourth Circuit's ruling, Virginia proposed a parallel program for women, Virginia Women's Institute for Leadership, or VWIL. The four-year state-sponsored undergraduate program would be located at Mary Baldwin College, a private liberal arts school for women and would be open initially to about 25 to 30 students. Although VWIL would share VMI's mission to produce citizen soldiers, the VWIL program would differ, as does Mary Baldwin College, from VMI in academic offerings, methods of education, and financial resources. The average combined SAT score of entrants 
at Mary Baldwin is about 100 points lower than the score for VMI freshmen. Mary Baldwin's faculty holds significantly fewer PhDs than the faculty at VMI and receives significantly lower salaries. While VMI offers degrees in liberal arts, the sciences, and engineering, Mary Baldwin, at the time of trial, offered only Bachelor of Arts degrees. A VWIL student seeking to earn an engineering degree could gain one without public support by attending Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri, for two years, paying the required private tuition. Experts in educating women at the college level compose the task force charged with designing the VWIL program. Task force members were drawn from Mary Baldwin's own faculty and staff. Training its attention on methods of instruction appropriate for most women, the task force determined that a military model would be wholly inappropriate for VWIL. VWIL students would participate in ROTC programs and a newly established, largely ceremonial Virginia Corps of Cadets. But the VWIL house would not have a military format and VWIL would not require its students to eat meals together or to wear uniforms during the school day. In lieu of VMI's adversative method, the VWIL task force favored a cooperative method which reinforces self-esteem. In addition to the standard Bachelor of Arts program offered at Mary Baldwin, VWIL students would take courses in leadership, complete an off-campus leadership externship, participate in community service projects, and assist in arranging a speaker series. Virginia represented that it will provide equal financial support for in-state VWIL students and VMI cadets and the VMI Foundation agreed to supply a $5.4625 million endowment for the VWIL program. Mary Baldwin's own endowment is about $19 million. VMI's is $131 million. Mary Baldwin will add $35 million to its endowment based on future commitments. VMI will add $220 million. The VMI Alumni Association has developed a network of employers interested in hiring VMI graduates. The association has agreed to open its network to VWIL graduates, but those graduates will not have the advantage afforded by a VMI degree. Section D. Virginia returned to the district court seeking approval of its proposed remedial plan, and the court decided the plan met the requirements of the Equal Protection Clause. The district court again acknowledged evidentiary support for these determinations. The VMI methodology could be used to educate women and, in fact, some women may prefer the VMI methodology to the VWIL methodology, but the controlling legal principles, the district court decided, do not require the Commonwealth to provide a mirror image, VMI, for women. The court anticipated that the two schools would achieve substantially similar outcomes, it concluded, if VMI marches to the beat of a drum, then Mary Baldwin marches to the melody of a fife, 
and when the march is over, both will have arrived at the same destination. A divided court of appeals affirmed the district court's judgment. This time, the appellate court determined to give greater scrutiny to the selection of means than to the Commonwealth's proffered objective. The official objective or purpose, the court said, should be reviewed deferentially. Respect for the legislative will, the court reasoned, meant that the judiciary should take a cautious approach inquiring into the legitimacy of the governmental objective and refusing approval for any purpose revealed to be pernicious. Providing the option of a single-gender college education may be considered a legitimate and important aspect of a public system of higher education, the appeals court observed. That objective, the court added, is not pernicious. Moreover, the court continued, the adversative method vital to a VMI education has never been tolerated in a sexually heterogeneous environment. The method itself was not designed to exclude women, the court noted, but women could not be accommodated in the VMI program, the court believed, for female participation in VMI's adversative training would destroy any sense of decency that still permeates the relationship between the sexes. Having determined, deferentially, the legitimacy of Virginia's purpose, the court considered the question of means. Exclusion of men at Mary Baldwin College and women at VMI, the court said, was essential to Virginia's purpose, for without such exclusion, the Commonwealth could not accomplish its objective of providing single-gender education. The court recognized that, as it analyzed the case, means merged into end, and the merger risked bypassing any equal protection scrutiny. The court therefore added another inquiry, a decisive test it called substantive comparability. The key question, the court said, was whether men at VMI and women at VWIL would obtain substantively comparable benefits at their institution or through other means offered by the state. Although the appeals court recognized that the VWIL degree lacks the historical benefit and prestige of a VMI degree, it nevertheless found the educational opportunities at the two schools sufficiently comparable. Senior Circuit Judge Phillips dissented. The court, in his judgment, had not held Virginia to the burden of showing an exceedingly persuasive justification for the Commonwealth's action. In Judge Phillips' view, the court had accepted rationalizations compelled by the exigencies of this litigation and had not confronted the Commonwealth's actual overriding purpose. That purpose, Judge Phillips said, was clear from the historical record. It was not to create a new type of educational opportunity for women, nor to further diversify the Commonwealth's higher education system, but was simply to allow VMI to continue to exclude women in order to preserve its historic character and mission. Judge Phillips suggested that the Commonwealth would satisfy the Constitution's equal protection requirement if it simultaneously opened single-gender undergraduate institutions having substantially comparable curricular and extracurricular programs funding, physical plant, administration, and support services, and faculty and library resources. But he thought it evident that the proposed VWIL program, in comparison to VMI, 
fell far short from providing substantially equal, tangible, and intangible educational benefits to men and women. The Fourth Circuit denied rehearing en banc. Circuit Judge Motz, joined by Circuit Judges Hall, Mernigan, and Michael, filed a dissenting opinion. Judge Motz agreed with Judge Phillips that Virginia had not shown an exceedingly persuasive justification for the disparate opportunities the Commonwealth supported. She asked, how can a degree from a yet-to-be-implemented supplemental program at Mary Baldwin be held substantively comparable to a degree from a venerable Virginia military institution that was established more than 150 years ago? Women need not be guaranteed equal results, Judge Mott said, but the Equal Protection Clause does require equal opportunity, and that opportunity is being denied here. Part 3 The cross petitions in this suit present two ultimate issues. First, does Virginia's exclusion of women from the educational opportunities provided by VMI extraordinary opportunities for military training and civilian leadership development. Deny to women capable of all the individual activities required of VMI cadets the equal protection of the laws guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. Second, if VMI's unique situation as Virginia's sole single-sex public institution of higher education, offends the Constitution's equal protection principle. What is the remedial requirement? We've reached the end of part one of this opinion, but don't worry, next episode will pick up reading exactly where this episode ended. Until next episode, thanks for listening to What SCOTUS Wrote Us.